Hiya, I'm Bruce Fumi. Did you know that Sherlock Holmes was Scottish? And I mean born and bred, lived and died in Scotland Scottish. If you want to know how I deduced that, then this is the video for you. Also, if you're generally interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then hit the subscribe button at the bottom right hand side of the screen at any time during this video. Also, buy me a coffee, become a member or get other information in the description below. In the meantime, let me outline the evidence by means of a story. Now, you might already know that Sherlock Holmes was invented by Arthur Conan Doyle. You may know that the pub painted black in the corner between Piccadilly Place and Yorkshire Place behind me is called the Conan Doyle. You may know that when there's no roadworks here, there's a statue of Sherlock Holmes on that island in the road behind me. You might even be aware that Arthur Conan Doyle lived here at number 11 Piccadilly Place, Edinburgh. And from these things, you might deduce that when I say Sherlock Holmes is Scottish, that I mean the author of Sherlock Holmes is Scottish. You would, however, be entirely wrong, my dear Watson. I can look down on Piccadilly Place from Carlton Hill here. You might even just be able to catch the Conan Doyle pub. But it's not the birthplace of Arthur Conan Doyle that makes Sherlock Holmes Scottish. Doyle was of Irish parentage, born in Scotland and educated at a Catholic school in England. So you see, he could have played for three out of the Six Nations rugby teams. Four if you count that fortnight he spent in Paris. And of course Wales is a principality rather than a country. What I'm trying to say is, he didn't like Italians, okay? But from his accent, you would have made the elementary deduction that he was Scottish. Let's imagine you were a bright Scottish lad who'd been given the privilege of a private education in a Jesuit school down south. They'd hoped that you'd become a priest. But whilst you're a caring sort, you were more interested in science. What would you do? That's right, you'd go to study medicine, wouldn't you? But where? Of course, at Edinburgh University. It was the best in the land. Some years earlier, it produced James Young Simpson. Now, he was the guy who discovered chloroform as an anaesthetic. In fact, I'll leave a link to my video about him at the end. It'll knock you out. Just watch it. After he graduated in 1881, Doyle spent 10 years in various jobs, working a whaling ship, travelling in Europe, studying in Vienna, doing a bit of writing. You know, the kind of workaday Victorian existence. Eventually, he decided to settle down in the south of England. He's still Scottish, remember? Well, Anglo-Irish Scots at the very least. So this was pre-NHS. He didn't have money to buy into a medical practice, so he set up on his own, but with no patients. Things didn't go well. So what are you going to do now? You're in a bit of fix, aren't you? How are you going to earn a living? You could write short stories. But what would catch the zeitgeist of the nation? If you think people are frustrated with policing today, imagine Victorian Britain, when you could be convicted in the say-so of corrupt authorities looking to pin some heinous crime on you, and there's no forensic evidence to prove them wrong. Or you right. Maybe it was you. Did you leave the toilet seat up? Doyle thought back to one of his lecturers at Edinburgh University. He knew this impressive surgeon well. He'd operated as a junior clerk for a year whilst at university. Doyle remembered one time when a patient came into surgery to be greeted with the question, Sir, did you enjoy your walk in the links this morning? The patient was stunned and he asked how the surgeon knew of this morning's perambulations. To which the doctor pointed to his shoes and commented that nowhere else in the town had that colour of clay. So he must have approached the surgery in that direction. Ah! The surgeon's name was Joseph Bell. 
He lived here at 2 Melville Crescent, not far from James Young Simpson, whose video you're going to watch next. It's now the Japanese consulate, and a plaque's been erected by the Japan Sherlock Holmes Club. Bell believed in the methodical application of observation, deduction, then diagnosis. And he trained Doyle and the other students to follow this system. But as well as being a doctor and a lecturer, Bell had an evening job too. You see, a colleague and acquaintance who did postmortems for the police recognised his skills and methods. And he would consult Bell, asking him to look at uh, a corpse and comment on the cause of death and stuff like that. Now, Bell used his deep observation, holistic methodology and deductive approach. And here, in the Georgian new town of Victorian Edinburgh, was the very beginnings of modern forensic pathology. Not only would Bell be the inspiration for Sherlock Holmes, we can also consider him the inspiration for CSI New York, CSI Miami, and even Quincy. In CSI Alabama, it was a black guy. CSI Fife, everyone's guilty. You see that, poking fun at prejudice, then immediately demonstrating prejudice myself. That's irony. You can detect it by an orangey colour and a flame test. So Bell's introduced to crime work by his friend and colleague called Little John. But it was Bell who was the star behind Little John's mask. There was one particular case, and it was in 1878, where both of them were called to the home of a wealthy French linguist. The linguist's wife was catatonic, dying from what he claimed was poisoning after a gas leak. Now, gas leaks wouldn't have been uncommon in Victorian Britain, but something didn't quite sit right with Bell. Visual observation verified that the victim had vomited vituperously. <laughs> Sorry, it just spilled out. Bell took the vomit stained pill for samples. He examined the lungs, which had none of the expected smell of gas. He tested the blood, analysed the pillow stains and had gas experts examine the pipework. And he came to the conclusion that Mrs Chantrell had died from an overdose of morphine. Now, police started to ask questions and witnesses came forward to reveal arguments between husband and wife. Accusations thrown, abuse hurled and threats made. He had left that toilet seat up. Now, Bell didn't seek the limelight. He was happy in the background as Little John took the centre stage, but as Chantrell walked to the gallows, a convicted murderer, he admitted that Little John and Bell had got him right enough. Now, Joseph Bell's name was in the public domain. It was nine years after the execution of Chantrell that Joseph Bell's alter ego was revealed to an even wider world. In March 1886, Arthur Conan Doyle created Sherlock Holmes, and a year later, his first story, A Study in Scarlet, was published. In truth, Arthur Conan Doyle didn't create Sherlock Holmes. He copied him, fully formed, from his old university lecturer, inventor of forensic science, and master of deductive reasoning, Joseph Bell. He wrote a letter of thanks to him years later to that effect. So Sherlock Holmes was public, whilst Joseph Bell was trying to remain private. A year later, something happened, and as the fictional Sherlock Holmes was gaining celebrity, the real Sherlock Holmes was brought in to work on the most infamous case of his time that we still talk about today. Whilst Conan Doyle was in the south of England introducing the fictional Sherlock Holmes to the public, Scotland Yard had heard of the real one. And they asked him to consult on a case that you already know about. I bet he didn't know though that the real Sherlock Holmes was asked to investigate the case of Jack the Ripper. London police sent the case files north and Bell and Littlejohn decided that they would both work separately on the file sent up to Scotland from Scotland Yard. You know that that got its name because it's where Scottish royalty stayed when they were visiting London away back in the day. Anyway, they worked on the case separately and then brought together their findings. And both 
came up with the same suspect. The report was sent down to London. Who did they identify as Jack the Ripper? Well, the report was kept for years before it disappeared. Did that create suspense? Was it kept a secret because one of the key suspects identified a respectable middle-class solicitor had jumped in the Thames with stones weighing him down in his pockets, after which the murders stopped. I suppose we'll never know. So whenever you watch an episode of Sherlock Holmes, or if it's more your bag, CSI, remember, they all started with Scotsman from Edinburgh. After returning to a country estate that's now part of Pennycook, Joseph Bell himself died in 1911, at the age of 74. He's buried here in Dean Cemetery in Edinburgh. It's a short walk from his home in the new town and indeed the home of James Young Simpson, whose video comes up next. Hamidokus can be a lamb alive. Cheerio and Rasta.